John Allen Chow served as a missionary with all nations. On November 16, 2018, John was killed by the tribesmen of the remote North Sentinel Island while attempting to share Christ with them. His death has lately been the subject of world news and has sparked mostly negative reactions and intense antagonism toward the very idea of missions and Chow himself. John's death has raised many questions about missionary preparation, public health and missions, and evaluating the risks associated with doing missions among the unreached. On this special episode of The Mission Table, Matthew Ellison addresses these critical questions in a conversation with Dr. Pam Arland, Global Training and Research Leader with All Nations. Join us now for this special episode of The Mission Table. Was his a wasted life? The Mission Table is a ministry of 1615 Church Missions Coaching, unleashing the potential of churches to reach the nations since 2004. This episode of The Mission Table was brought to you in partnership with Living Water International. Living Water International is a faith-based nonprofit organization that helps communities in developing countries to create sustainable water, sanitation, and hygiene programs in response to the global water crisis. We would also like to thank our sponsors, Shepherd Staff, Avant, Food for the Hungry, Pioneers, Encountering the World of Islam, Perspectives, Missio Nexus, and Ethnos 360. I'm Matthew Ellison. I'm the host of The Mission Table. And today we have an impromptu episode that was actually unanticipated. I'm speaking at a conference in Topeka, Kansas, a missions conference. And lo and behold, I run into Pam Artland. I just met her, but uh, you'll be familiar with her, her name, I'm sure, from the media. But Pam is um, a doctor. She's a member of the International Leadership Team with All Nations. And uh, that name's probably familiar to you because on November 16th, John Allen Chow was reportedly killed by Sentinelese tribesmen that he was attempting to reach with the gospel. You've probably seen it in the media. There's been a lot of antagonism, um, a significant amount of criticism, and we thought this would be an appropriate time to address some questions that we know people have. But before we do that, Pam, I think it would be helpful if you let our viewing audience know who you are. All right. Well, I have been with All Nations for almost 20 years. When I was much younger than I am now, 26, I went to an unengaged people group in Central Asia. And an unengaged people group is one that has no known believers and no missionaries, no opportunity to learn about Jesus. And to do that job well, I got a doctorate in linguistics from the University of Texas okay. at Arlington. And then about 10 years ago, so I spent 10 years in, in Central Asia, and then about 10 years ago, I switched to training other missionaries that All Nations has been sending out. And I've been helping to train All Nations missionaries ever since. That's great. Maybe you could also let our audience know a little bit about John Allen Chow. They've maybe read some of the media that's out there, but you know, your organization was obviously very connected to him. So let us know a little bit about his story. Yeah, All Nations missionary John Chow was a great man in my estimation. He was humble and gentle. He was kind. He was very thoughtful. Mm. My first contact with him was in 2017. He sent me an email um, telling me about this calling of God that he thought he had on his life to the North Sentinelese and asking if All Nations could help him. And I said, well, how to get to the North Sentinelese? Honestly, we have no idea. Yeah. Um, and I said, what kind of help are you actually looking for? And he said, we're looking for help in two areas. One is the area of prayer, and the other is in the area of training. Mm -hmm. And so as a trainer, I asked him, well, what kind of training? And he, he said, well, I, I already have a degree in health science. I'm already a wilderness certified EMT. Um, I've already survived a snake bite on my own in the wilderness. He said, I know how to live in the jungle. I know how to do all of that. He said, the thing I don't know how to do is learn language. I don't know how to learn culture. I don't know how to make disciples who can make disciples. Could you help me with those things? Mm -hmm. And I said, sure, I think we can help you with those things. And so I started assigning him books to read. 
And I said, well, before I sign you books to read, tell me what you're already reading. And he sent me a photo of books piled this high. Wow. And I thought, people don't really read that much. But by just a couple of weeks later, he had finished all of those books and was asking me for more books to read. And so eventually he came to our in-house training, which is called the Church Planting Experience that All Nations offers. Um, and so he came to that training in Kansas City, where our headquarters is in the United States, for three weeks. And then he completed a one-year online internship uh, with some of his fellow students as well. Mm -hmm. um, so those were some of the ways that we were able to help him. Um, and everybody who is with him remembers him as a man that babies like to crawl on, hmm. that they, you know, babies and children were comfortable with him, and yet he was physically strong, uh, but gentle at the same time. Yeah. So in your description of John, you've answered some of the questions that I know people have. I've read several blog posts and Washington Post articles, many others, New York Times, and they said that he was ill-prepared, that he was a, a rogue actor who was portrayed as just showing up among the Sentinelese saying, Jesus loves you, but that doesn't appear to be the case. No, John was very well prepared. And I, so, you know, John's journals are available in the public media. And it's interesting to me the things that people notice and don't notice yeah. about his story that's mm -hmm. in those journals. And I'm, I'm thankful to John for writing the story of the last few days of his life so that we can learn from it and be inspired by it. Mm -hmm. You know, he took gifts for the North Sentinelese um, so that he could show that he was peaceful. Um, and we know that they actually accepted those gifts at one point. And so he thought, well, maybe they will accept him to live on the island with them. And that was his goal all along was to live on that island long term. And so at the beginning, he was speaking in English and he was singing songs in English because he had no other options available. Right. But he had already started taking linguistic notes on their language. He had already started writing down things he'd noticed about right. how their society was organized. So he was already thinking about a long term mission to the North Sentinelese. Yeah. So his long term goal was to learn the language. Absolutely. Yeah. His goal was to learn the language. So when you factor in the training that he received through All Nations, but then all the training that happened prior to that, that really led him to this place. I think one of the things we need to consider when we see the media commentary is some of its half truths, some of its assumptions. And so I really appreciate the fact that this interview gives an opportunity to expose a larger audience to the other side of the story, that this man was prepared, that this was a lifelong calling in many ways. Um, again, preparation leading up to his interaction with you and then further preparation for some of the very specific things he needed to be this missionary among an unengaged people group, linguistics, prayer, all those pieces. Let, let's address another question that I've seen um, in a lot of the media commentary, and that is that it was really a, a bad decision. And some of the language out there is worse than that, but it was a bad decision for him to come in because of exposure to pathogens, illnesses, disease. So what about the health concerns? I, I've heard some people say, well, how could he possibly love these people? He was going to expose them to illnesses and, and many of them may even die as a result of this. Can you speak to that? Yes. As, as a, a family, as all nations, we discussed some of those issues with John and he had thought through them. He actually sought out 13 different immunizations. Mm -hmm. He put himself in a type of quarantine. And uh, he also did some research. And there is reason to believe that in the modern time period with available antibiotics and with ongoing medical care, and remember, he was, he was planning to be there long term, right. with ongoing medical care that people could survive a first contact situation. And so, yes, he had thought of those things. And honestly, nobody knows for sure right. what would have happened. And I think it's also important for people to realize that we don't know if the North Sentinelese are healthy now. It is very likely that their children have a high infant mortality rate. It's very likely that they're dying from preventable mm -hmm. diseases because they haven't had any access to modern medical care. We simply don't know even what their current medical state is like. Yeah. So let's change gears a little bit. And we've addressed some of the questions that I know I've seen um, in the media, questions that our viewers probably have themselves. But let's get to the heart of the matter. Is it worth it? I mean, 
the Great Commission is about taking the gospel to every nation, every tribe, every tongue, as you talked about. And some of them are not only unreached, they're unengaged. No one's even targeting them with the gospel, as it were. No one's zeroing in on them. But the cost associated with this, Pam, is tremendous. I mean, the dangers associated with engaging these unreached people groups is rising. And I think it will continue to rise, right? I mean, I think it's David Platt who said, all the easy places are taken. The, the reason the unreached are unreached is because they're hard to reach. It's dangerous. So should the church still be doing this in this day and age? Should we still be engaging these unreached people groups that are going to be costly reached? Is it worth it? I do agree that it's difficult to reach those who haven't yet had a chance to hear about Jesus. We often say within all nations that the low-hanging fruit has already been taken. Yeah. And the remaining people who haven't yet had a chance to hear about Jesus are high in mountains in the middle of a desert. They're in dangerous places that are in the middle of war zones, and we recognize that. But I have to say that Jesus is worth it. Yeah. Um, you know, there's an old missions quote that says something like, if serving an earthly king is worth it, how much more is it worth it to serve a mm -hmm. heavenly king? And you know, within my own family, we have we honor those who give their lives to a country through the military. Right. And we think that that's an honorable sacrifice. And our soldiers actually even honor enemy combatants who fall in battle because falling in battle for an earthly king is valued by us. And Jesus is worth so much more than any country on earth. Yeah. We're so much more than any earthly king. I know it's difficult, but I do think that it's worth it. Um, when I went to the field as a missionary myself, I counted the cost and I knew very well that I might die and I might get arrested or something might happen to me. And those things did happen. I mean, obviously I didn't die, but I was on the mm -hmm. edge of death a few times. And I counted the cost and decided to do it anyway. Yeah. And I would honestly make that decision again for myself. Yeah. I think it's John Piper who says, we do not commend what we do not cherish. Mm -hmm. Or uh, another way of saying that is, where zeal for worship is weak, zeal for missions will also be weak. And when you know that Jesus is worth it, when you treasure him, you're going to have zeal to make him known. Paul had that ambition. He wanted to make sure that every nation, tribe, and tongue heard about him. So let, let's talk about this from a little different angle. Um, hell. Uh, Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which they must be saved. So it's worth it in that sense too, right? I mean, the greatest injustice in the world today is the fact that there are people groups that are on a path that leads to hell and no one has told them that there's a pathway that leads to heaven, right? That's right. I agree that it's one of the greatest injustices that some people have so much access to the gospel and have so many resources available to them while some have none at all. And what's interesting is that some of our strongest non-Christian critics in the midst of this have actually said, but wait a minute, if you really believe that hell is a real place, then you should be filled with zeal. That's right. You should be willing to give your last ounce of blood for this. Even they recognize this. Yeah. I don't know if you remember a video that went viral years ago. It was Penn and Teller. I always get them mixed up, the magicians in Vegas. And um, he's an uh, agnostic or atheist, I'm not sure. But he said at a magic show, he was, he was approached by someone and shared the gospel with him, gave him a Bible, and, and he was talking to someone. And, Weren't you offended by that? He goes, absolutely not. He said, that man really believes that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And he goes, how much do you have to hate someone to not tell them? He said, I don't believe it. But how much do you have to hate someone to withhold from them the news that they could you know, go to heaven and not to hell? So I just thought that was interesting. So let's kind of wrap this up here. I really appreciate the dialogue, by the way. It's really wonderful. Um, how do we evaluate risk when it comes to finishing the task of engaging the unreached, unengaged peoples of the world, of getting the gospel to all nations? How do we evaluate the risk? And, you know, evaluating risk is something I, I honestly think about almost daily in our basic marching orders that Jesus gave us in Luke 10. You know, he said, I send you out as sheep among wolves. And he talks about how dangerous this is going to be. And we know that the only protection for the sheep is the shepherd himself. Mm. 
And so we look to Jesus for our protection. And, you know, I, uh, I consider myself to have been mentored by Hudson Taylor, although I obviously never met him. I'm not quite that old, um, but I've read, you know, just about anything he ever wrote or anything ever written about him. And one of the things he wrestled with was this issue of risk. Mm. In 1865, he felt like the Lord was asking him to start the China Inland Mission. Um, but Hudson Taylor knew that if he sent people to the inland of China, that some of them would die because he knew it was dangerous and he yeah. knew it was risky. And in his journals, he wrote that he was almost insane with this issue of wow. what to do and that he had wrestled with it for two or three months. So a good sender wisely sent him away to Brighton Beach to talk to Jesus about this issue. Mm -hmm. And the Lord finally said to him, he said, Hudson, um, God sends people to the mission field. No agency sends people. No church send pe sends people to the mission field. God himself sends people to the mission yeah. field. And whether they live or die on the mission field is God's responsibility ultimately. Now, of course, I don't want people to be foolhardy. Right. I don't want people to be flippant in their actions. I do want them to think through mm -hmm. the plans that they make. Uh, but I know what my job is. My job is to partner with what God is asking people to do. And I'm going to train them as best I can. I'm going to partner with them as best I can. But ultimately, he's the shepherd that protects the sheep, not me. And so that's how I have to evaluate risk. Yeah, that's really good. You know, we're talking earlier, and I, I think one of the things that I'm going to call it disturbing is that in American Christianity, we prize safety so much. We prize convenience and comfort. And we do so to the detriment of our souls and our calling. And I think it was, I don't know the author, so I won't quote it, but um, someone said safety is an illusion, right? And he said the irony about this is that on a daily basis, um, we experience all types of risks just in living life. And yet, when we think about the risks associated with doing gospel ministry, with doing hard ministry, we shrink back from taking those risks only to preserve a safety that isn't even real. Um, we're not safe in America. We're not safe getting in our car, driving down the street. Uh, again, safety is an illusion, and yet we shrink back from these gospel risks. And what I find really amazing in my experience, and I'm sure you've experienced this as a missionary serving in Central Asia, but when, when I step into those risks, when I move towards them, again, in a prayerful, calculated way, not flippantly, my joy increases. Um, my contentment increases. I think some of the best joy available to us this side of heaven comes when we suffer and sacrifice for the sake of the name that is worth it. Yeah, I agree. As we suffer and sacrifice, the beauty of Jesus increases. The grace increases. Um, I've had people ask me, you know, how do you do that? How do you do what you've done? And all I can say is that when I'm in a difficult situation, I can either run away or I can get really intimate with Jesus. Yeah. And I have chosen to move towards Jesus. And because of that, I've experienced a level of intimacy with him that not everybody gets to experience. Um, he will prove himself yeah, to be right. strong in those moments for us. Yeah, amen, amen. Just one final thought here. I read it somewhere this last week, but who will take John's place? There is a, you know, there's viewers right now watching this and, and maybe they're being stirred up by the Holy Spirit, but we need more people who will take courageous, Christ-centered risks in order to see the Great Commission fulfilled. Yes, we do. And it's amazing that All Nations missionary, John Chow, in his last hours was saying, if I fall, mm -hmm. who will take my place? Talk about a long range plan. Yes, that's right. I mean, this man was thinking in terms of eternity and now he's yeah. had the joy of seeing Jesus face to face. Um, you know, it's not only the North Sentinelese, it's literally thousands of people groups right. in many different places. Some are extremely risky, some are maybe less risky, um, but there's risk involved in all of yeah. them. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing um, how John's life might inspire others to go and give people a chance to fall in love with Jesus in the same way that we have. Amen. We saw a, a resurgence in missionary activity when 
Jim Elliott and Nate Saint and Raju Darian were martyred. May it be so again. May, may God fan into flame our missionary heart um, and use this, what would seeming, you know, seemingly tragedy for his glory and for the sake of his good. If, if I could just say this one last thing. Please. As parents and as churches are thinking of sending their best to the mission fields, it can be really hard. Yeah. And I recognize that because it's your beloved son, it's your beloved daughter, it's hopefully your mm -hmm. kid that grew up in your Sunday school program at your church. I would just encourage people to once again um, offer them to the Lord and remember that they belong to the Lord. And if he should call them to do difficult things, please don't inhibit them. This episode of The Mission Table was brought to you in partnership with Living Water International. Living Water International is a faith-based nonprofit organization that helps communities in developing countries to create sustainable water, sanitation, and hygiene programs in response to the global water crisis. We would also like to thank our sponsors, Shepherd Staff, Avant, Food for the Hungry, Pioneers, Encountering the World of Islam, Perspectives, Missio Nexus, and Ethnos 360. This has been The Mission Table, presented by 1615.